Hey, Tarot 200, it's uh, the Walshes. And today is Sunday, February 4th. Today is actually World Cancer Day. So it's a great day to have the lecture about cancer. And I always ask John if I can um, sit in and, and help with this one because I'm a cancer patient and I spend a lot of time studying um, cancer treatments, cancer outcomes, how to navigate the medical system. I spend a lot of time mentoring new patients um, online and, and in support groups to try to help people that are newly diagnosed. In fact, we did this talk a couple months back for Keck School of Medicine. Yeah, we did a great, we had a great time doing a seminar at Keck School of Medicine that was attended by both um, care providers, doctors, nurses, uh, patients, etc., talking about um, you know, what it's like to be a cancer patient and how to navigate the medical system and things like that. And so, what it's like to be the husband. Yes, and what it's like to be patient. a caregiver because John's an awesome caregiver. So anyway, so today's World Cancer Day and the theme of this year's World Cancer Day is closing the care gap because we know that um, with cancer and with a lot of illnesses, there is a gap between the people who get the best care and the people who get care that maybe isn't as good. And that gap can be because of income. It can be because of education. It can be um, because of where you live. People who live in rural areas have difficulty accessing care. It can be, um, you know, a lot of cancer patients are over 65 and have difficulty accessing treatment. Um, because of their age and because of the type of insurance they have. And their mobility. Um, even. And their yeah. mobility. They um, get there. And uh, there's a cancer care gap for people of color, for people who are LGBTQ+, for people who are immigrants, for people who don't speak English well. Um, so there's a lot of things that we can do better in terms of cancer diagnosis and cancer treatment. That access, um, the culture of those communities, everything. Yeah, you know, so. yeah. So if you're thinking about going to medical school or going into public health, um, hopefully you'll be part of the answer. Um, Patient advocacy, community, so, community advocacy. So I'm going to throw down a couple numbers for you. Here in the United States, we have about 17 million people who have cancer. Um, about 2 million people get diagnosed every year. About 600 to 700,000 die every year. So obviously the survival rate is tends to be more than one, one year. Um, about one in 20 people have cancer. So most of you in this class will know someone. You'll have um, uh, typically an older person in your family who's been diagnosed with cancer or, or a friend or a former teacher. Or sometimes we have young students in our class who, who are um, fighting cancer while they're going to school at USC. So you probably have a personal connection to someone um, and, who has or has been diagnosed with cancer. And one out of every two males will get cancer in their lifetime. Those are just the statistics. Doesn't mean you're going to get it, but that's it. One out of every three women get cancer yeah. in their and lifetime. Yeah, obviously so. your risk goes way up as you get older. But right. before we get into the meat, I wanted to throw some statistics down. Also, we want to remind them about this. <laughs> yes, we have our, um, <laughs> our short paper assignment coming up February 12th. It's due by the end of the day. Um, you know, if you have questions, email us. We can Zoom with you. We can text. We can um, email back and forth. Um, don't be shy if you're confused about the assignment or if you're confused about the directions. Um, we usually send out a video explaining how to do it, and I'll send out an right. email for people that don't like videos. And here's so right here. Here's option. all the instructions. It's really clear. This is equivalent to a slide deck. It's a step-by-step -step, um, set of, of instructions that you follow. You go to these websites. You gather the data, um, and everything is pretty laid out here. And then. It tells you all about the rubric right there. And guess what? We actually had the video from um, last semester. So you yeah. can use that. Okay. And there are no stupid questions. We get paid to answer your questions. Yeah. So don't feel bad if you to, don't understand something. We get paid to be here for you. Yeah. Mentor you. Yeah, we get paid to help. Okay, so let's get into assignment for week five, starting right tomorrow, February 5th. What does it say right there? It says CT1 assignment due Monday, okay. February 12th. Okay. Just in case you um, missed so it the got, first time. <laughs> you got a week starting tomorrow. Right. Okay. So um, I, I, because I'm a cancer patient, I always want to caution people, if you or a friend or a relative are diagnosed, you may go onto the internet and do a Google search. And um, sometimes what you find out is scary. I always tell people, treat statistics, especially statistics about survival, with a grain of salt, because all of these statistics look backwards. All of these statistics are based on treatments that were available five years ago, 10 years ago. Now, I was diagnosed almost 11 years ago. When I was diagnosed, none of the treatments that are being used today were available. 
Um, I, I, in fact, the only thing that would have been available to me was chemotherapy. I happen to have a mutation that makes me resistant to chemotherapy. So it wouldn't have worked. I would have gone through the pain and, and, you know, discomfort of having that treatment. And then, and then it would have only given me maybe a couple months remission or something like that. She's in treatment so, right now. So yeah, I'm in treatment right now so it, and I'm it, doing okay. <laughs> she had, um, almost 11 years ago diagnosis. Yes. Yeah? yes. And then, um, and then Seven years ago, she had to go in the first round of treatment. It lasted three years because it was a clinical trial. Mm -hmm. It was in remission then. If you combine those three years of trial with the remaining um, almost four years, you know, kind of came out of remission, but she full-blown came out of remission, had to go back in. Last summer. Last summer, and yeah. she's got yeah. five so more, I, six more months. So I have the kind of cancer that isn't curable yet. They're getting close and they're working pretty hard on it. A lot of people may be diagnosed with cancer. You'll get treated and then you never have to be treated again. But you still have um, the emotional impact of having cancer and the fear of what if it comes back. So there's a lot of stuff going on um, for those cancer patients. So anyway, when we look at statistics, the best places to go are the National Cancer Institute, which is the NCI. They publish something called the SEER report, which has cancer information, mm -hmm. usually once a year. They've been a little bit slow lately. Um, the American Cancer Society, ACS, also has really good information, and they do an annual report on cancer statistics. So if you're interested in learning more or if you need to know more, those are good places to go. So we're using the 2022 SEER report because somehow they skipped a year and um, we haven't seen the updated numbers yet. It's really important when we look at the numbers, we're looking at cancer incidence and cancer mortality, who dies. And it's always expressed per 100,000 um, patients. And that way, um, when, we, when we normalize the data by expressing it per 100,000 um, people or 100,000 patients, you know, then, um, then we can compare different populations. We can compare how are people doing in California versus New York or versus Texas or versus Florida. And we can kind of see where are the gaps in treatment and, and adjust strategies and things like that. So remember that those, those cancer death rates are per 100,000 people and um, cancer incidence is per 100,000 people and, in the U.S. And statistically, this is called epidemiology, where you're looking at um, the kind of the, the photo of how cancer is. Incidence refers to the increase in number of cases that year. So incidence for increase. And then you'll hear another term called prevalence. And that looks like at not only the people that got it for the first time that year, but everybody that has it in the country at that moment in time. So yeah. it captures everything. So that's the difference between prevalence and, and incidence. Yeah. So one of the themes of the, well, Cancer Day Close the Care Gap, they talk about the fact that you, you people will tend to do better if they live in a wealthier country than if they live in a country that isn't as wealthy. And Why is um, that? What do rich people get? Rich people get better stuff is something my law school professor used know. to say. Um, rich people have access to better treatments. Now, for me, with my particular diagnosis, if I could go anywhere in the world for treatment, the best places in the world are the United States, Australia, Germany, and England. They have the best clinical trials. And it's going to be different based on cancer types. But there's a lot of countries out there that weren't on that short list of where you should go. So those types of gaps are things that we see. Most of what we're going to talk about right now are United States numbers. So keep in mind, if you have um, friends or relatives in another country, the situation and the drugs that they have access to may be very different. So when we look at this SEER report, they tend to have a little bit of a lag on the statistics. It just takes a while for them to process it. So they're looking in the 2022 report, they're looking at a cohort of people from 2015 to 2019. And what they saw is that they saw cancer death rates going down in general and cancer death rates for lung cancer and melanoma decreasing the most. Now, why is that happening? That's happening because we have new treatments, really great checkpoint inhibitors. Um, we've, we've unpacked kind of uh, the, the, what the scientists say is that we're unpacking, unpacking the genetics and the biology of these cancer cells, and we're finding treatments that we can then apply to different cancers because they have this commonality. These this checkpoint um, inhibitors, what the cancer cells and the ferrous, they, they have a way of telling the immune system like Yoda, I'm not cancer. Please yeah, go. just ignore me. They ignore me. And so they developed the drugs because they can't do it anymore. So now when the immune system is sniffing around and they detect a cancer cell, this checkpoint can't work because we put a 
like, like a drug right there, so the immune system can't do that anymore, so and you, then the immune system attacks. Your cancer become your immune system becomes very very strong. Right. Um, we're looking at decreases among um, cancer death rates among um, adolescents and young adults. That's what AYA stands for, and decreases among children. We are seeing increases in some cancer rates, incidence rates, so, so new cancer diagnosis rates among young adults, among GI cancers, and we'll talk about why. Um, go back up a little, oh, sorry. little bit. <laughs> There we go. Okay. Right so um, a lot of times people say to me, why does gerontology have to be all about the bad stuff? Like all the things that are wrong. It's not well, all about what's well, wrong. One good thing is when we get older, you get all the money. You have all the money. <laughs> and we have all the houses and everything yeah. else. Yeah. But That's anyway, your future. So um, there's a lot that we know about how to prevent cancer. And about 50% of cancer cases can be prevented by making lifestyle changes. So don't smoke or cut down on your smoking. If you do exercise, try to get exercise every day. Try to eat healthy, eat less processed food, eat whole foods, um, eat fruits and vegetables, um, drink moderately. If you drink alcohol, um, it's generally considered to be safer for men and women. Men can drink two drinks a day. Women can drink one drink a day. Okay. If you're in college, you're probably going to go over that from time to time. But um, skip a day, <laughs> try to skip a day in between. And if you have higher risk in one area, maybe you're drinking more than that, then don't smoke. Or maybe you're drinking more than that, then try to exercise and make sure that you're hydrated. Limit your sun exposure. Make sure that you're wearing sunscreen. And it doesn't matter what color your skin is, um, whether you're white or black or Hispanic, whatever you whatever you are, you should still be wearing sunscreen and being careful about your sun exposure. Um, here's all the cigarette smoking related cancers. So, so there's, there's an enormous amount of data relating cigarette smoking to not just lung cancer. We kind of all know about lung cancer, um, but to other types of cancers. And I put this chart in the reading because I think it's so interesting um, to me. And I've had several relatives with lung cancer who were smokers. But you, not, it's not just lung cancer, it's, it's cancer of the larynx, cancer of the esophagus, um, oral cavity cancer, bladder cancer, because the chemicals when you smoke will sit in your bladder and cause bladder cancer. Yeah. It's um, in the blood. Right? Liver and cancer. Then it goes through the kidneys and then Kidney the cancer, um, stomach cancer, um, colorectal cancer, pancreatic cancer. My dad was a lifelong smoker and he was overweight and he had three cancers that that were related to those two risk factors. He was first diagnosed with kidney cancer, treated, did okay. Then he was diagnosed with uh, bladder cancer, was treated for that. And then he was diagnosed with um, lung cancer. So have, and of course we have a lot of cancer in my family. So there's probably something else going on genetic too. Genetic predisposition. So genetic predisposition. And he grew up on a farm. So he was exposed to chemicals, um, you know, fertilizers and, and pesticides and things like that growing up, drinking well water and cistern water. Right. And so that may have contributed to. And that's epidemiology. It's hard to attribute it to, you know, statisticians will kind of, take each one of those variables and say, okay, this one's the most likely, but, and just, you know, when you, you think about smoking a cigarette, you know, and I, I actually never smoked cigarettes my whole life. I don't, you know, um, maybe smoked a little pot when I was a kid. But then, <laughs> yeah. He's not innocent. <laughs> not innocent. But I didn't, I just didn't like cigarettes. And, uh, um, but w when people that smoke, you get that rush because the nicotine goes from the cigarette through your lungs into your blood and the blood then goes all throughout your body and you, and, and you get, um, um, a little agitation. Okay. Well, so do all the carcinogens. They go from cigarette through lungs into the blood, and then yeah. they get distributed everywhere. Yeah. And a big, um, if you scroll down to the next thing, okay. So some of you might be saying, what if I vape? What if I vape nicotine or I'm vaping cannabis? What about that? The answer is we don't really know yet. Um, if you look at this graph, it links cigarette sales and lung cancer mortality in the U.S., and so there's a bit of a gap between when cigarette sales started to go up mm -hmm. and then, um, and then lung the, cancer right deaths here. started to go up. And started and noticing, so, you know, they were here, but now we started doing documenting. It right you know, there, vaping so. has become pretty popular in the last five or 10 years. So it may take 20 years for us to really start to see epidemiologically what um, the risks are and whether or not vaping, whether it's, you know, vaping, uh, um, uh, 
tobacco or vaping and cannabis, whether or not that translates into lung cancer or other types of cancer. And these cancers. are all just public health initiatives. So you, I don't, you guys don't know where you're going to be with, you know, someday in a career, but you know, you get involved in the CDC or um, our, our state or community um, public health offices, then you are maybe part of the marketing, et cetera, you know, that, that we talked about here. And then it has an impact. People smoke less and you see down yeah. comes to death. So, so if you awesome. have family members who are lifelong smokers, it is now recommended that they get scanned and screened for lung cancer periodically. And there's a very low number of people who are aware of this and are, are, are taking advantage of this um, screening um, for lung cancer. So it's definitely better if you have lung cancer to get diagnosed earlier. Yep. It allows you to have access to um, more and different and easier types of treatment. So um, definitely encourage your relatives to get out there and get screened. Okay. Physical activity. Physical activity, which is, um, if you think about it, we, we study blue zones and we teach a class about blue zones in Costa Rica. Um, they tend to have very low levels of cancer because they're walking as a daily part of their day. Now, if you're at USC and you're running across campus to get to class, that's reducing your risk of cancer. That daily exercise, it may not feel like it's that big of a deal, but just walking to class and having that part of your regular activity is going to be really yeah. helpful to, um, to prevent um, many types of cancer. Don't, especially, don't take the elevators. Take the stairs. Yeah. You know, these are purposeful exercises. Especially um, cancers like breast, colorectal, and endometrial cancer. Now, some studies have been done, and it's still early days yet, so we don't have robust data, but we have some data that shows that women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer and treated for breast cancer, who then engage in healthy diets and um, daily exercise they have a, a significant reduction in the risk of the cancer coming back. So that's a good thing. So even once you are diagnosed with cancer, there's things you can do to improve your outcome. That's fun. <laughs> so alcohol, yes. The bad news, and John and I, during the pandemic, we were definitely guilty of uh, taking... No, uh, taking, really? We took wine at five <laughs> very seriously. <laughs> But there's, you know, <laughs> we've, we cut down, yeah, we yeah. cut down more recently. They We're actually believe in the blue zone. Some of them, they drink, uh, you know, a, a wine that has high in antioxidants. It, it can lower your stress. So they believe in the wine at five, having one glass a day. But, you know, I, I think yeah, you yeah, temper yeah. that with every other day or something. Yeah, like exactly. <laughs> try, try not to go overboard. Hmm. So anyway, so alcohol, again, not surprisingly, contributes to cancers in the colon and the rectum because it's going through your GI symptom. And, and it's a little bit surprisingly to me, it does contribute to female breast cancer. So it's because it's fat soluble. Yeah. So reducing and your drinking. You have some fat here. Yeah. And reducing your drinking, um, which which uh, happens as you get older, you just don't have time to do it, um, will reduce your risk for cancer. So uh, these are um, charts that are taken from the SEER report. And there's two charts that we're showing you. So when you have quiz questions, pay attention in the quiz question to whether we're asking you about trends in the rates of new cancer cases. What, what or is that rate of new? That's an increase incidence. incidence. Yeah. Or the death rate. So that you'll be looking at different charts depending on whether we're asking you about the rates of new cases or the death rates. So the red um, bars mean an increase. The blue bars mean a decrease. So we see um, these trends that prostate cancer is getting diagnosed more often, that melanoma is getting diagnosed more often in women. Now, does that mean that there are more cases? Does it mean that we have better screening? Um, I don't really know. Um, it, it, it's not easy sometimes to parse out when we have better screening or better awareness that leads people to go to the doctor. Oh, I have this funny thing on my arm. I better go get it checked. And these it are, turns out to these be are all, you know, I'm looking at these. These are all very age related too. And so people live longer, you know, and you're more likely to get these for sure. So yeah. And some of them like the liver cancer, the kidney cancer, um, oral cavity cancer, those are related to things like alcohol and, and poor diet. Um, but the good news is that we're seeing decreases in a lot of different cancer types for both men and women. Um, and so, you know, we'd like to continue to push that forward. In the, in the perfect world, no one would ever get cancer. In the next most perfect world, you'd get cancer, but it'll be a just a chronic condition that's manageable, that's treatable, like diabetes or high blood pressure, and you don't have to worry about dying. And this is if you average all of these sites. Um, you see there is just a small drop here and a small increase here for, for women. Um, you know, it's, it's just all public health. What can we do to, to reduce our risk, okay, 
The good news, though, if you do get these cancers, like I said, they're, they're more treatable. And so we can scroll down here and kind of look down here at the death rates and see you see what's going on here. Okay, so we're seeing an increase in uterine cancer death rates, liver cancer death rates, oral cavity, pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer is still That's a, a challenge. One. One. Um, uh, it tends to be asymptomatic so that it gets diagnosed late when things are pretty progressed and it may be metastatic at that point. And so that's a cancer that I think um, we could do a lot more in terms of research and looking for ways to prevent it and ways to diagnose it early and, and best treatments. And, and I think we'll get there. So there are improvements in treatments for pancreatic cancer and not all pancreatic cancers are the same. Some are a lot more treatable than others. Um, but we're seeing a lot of decreases in the death rates. Um, if you go down to the bottom, um, lung and melanoma, because we have these new checkpoint inhibitors, we've got these great new treatments. Get the immune system um, on board, baby. And we see for, for women, Same here. leukemia and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Yeah. Now, I have been the benefit. We always say as patients, we always say there's no good time to be diagnosed with cancer, but there's been no better time to have cancer than right now because of the research that's been going on and the FDA has speeded drug approval. So for people who have a blood cancer like me, my tumor's in my blood. So if, a, if a, uh, I participated in a couple different studies where I let them take blood whenever they want and my blood is in a, um, a patient uh, tissue registry, so anyone worldwide can, can dial up and say, hey, I'd like the blood of someone with these characteristics, and they can send my sample off to them. So when you have a blood sample, it's easy to study in the lab. So they're developing treatments using blood cancers that then can be used on other cancers, like the CAR-T um, treatment is a big thing that people are talking about uh, right now, where you harness your T cells in your immune system and modify them, put them back in the patient. And they're using that for blood cancers like I have, but they're also using it for solid tumor cancers like breast cancer. And you see so, here, see there, there's, you know, these are significant changes in death rates. And again, we compare it back to um, the likelihood of getting the cancer right here. So this is all about public health exposure. Once people do get it, then we do have um, uh, medicine available now that helps to treat us. So that's what's awesome. Right. Cool. 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 Okay. So um, the other thing I want to talk about is screening. So you can help um, improve your outcome by getting regular screening. And so, for example, I have to have colonoscopies every three years because my cancer was actually discovered in my colon through a routine colonoscopy. And so that's the schedule I'm on. I think John's on a five-year schedule. Um, but those are really great cancer screenings that can detect the cancer early, treat it. Um, you know, mammograms, really easy, um, need to do it once a year. And where people just, they just get, um, I don't know, I don't think it's lazy, but we are all juggling a lot of things in our daily well, this, lives. This right here wasn't lazy, all right? So this was, <laughs> this was, this was three years where people didn't go to the doctor. Yeah, so I yeah. skipped my mammogram one year during the COVID pandemic because as a as a leukemia patient, I was pretty afraid of being in a, a hey, doctor's... My neighbor just got COVID next <laughs> yeah. door. Um, I didn't want to get COVID. So anyway, so um, we need to be aware of the fact that during the COVID pandemic, people got out of their normal routine of getting their colonoscopies, getting their prostate exams, getting their mammograms, getting their skin cancer checks. And so what we, um, uh, unfortunately, what the research is showing, what they're predicting is that we're going to see from the COVID-19 pandemic and the dr dr dramatically reduced level of cancer screening that we're going to see later stage diagnosis and worse outcomes. Delayed treatment also happened during the pandemic because um, you know doctors were saying, well, if you can wait, you should, because you don't want to be immunocompromised during the pandemic. And if you scroll down- It's, it's a cohort uh, effect. You know what they call it in, in epidemiology? The pig and the python. It's, pig and the python. <laughs> it just kind of so, moves through yeah, the system. So. Sadly. So what we're going to see, this is the estimated cumulative excess deaths, so extra deaths from colorectal and breast cancers in the US that we're gonna see up in the next, say, seven, eight, nine years. So you can see um, 
it starts small blue the dark blue is colorectal the light blue is breast and it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger so that we'll be seeing um annually something like five thousand three to five thousand extra extra deaths per year um so your homework is to talk to your family members, talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors, talk to your relatives and say, hey, have you been getting your cancer screening? Have you been going in and getting your annual checkup with your doctor? Make sure that that, that the people you love and you care about are doing these things to to get early screening and yeah, early you diagnosis. you want to reduce your cancer risk? Um, That's how you do it right there. They woozy, that's woozy. Dogs are good pet therapy. I'm such a good girl. Okay, you want to say goodbye? Okay. Yes. And you know what? <laughs> Lucy had a little growth on her ear not too long ago, and she's only two years old. But I took her to the doctor, and we checked it out, and it turned out to be benign. But, hey, stuff happens even to dogs. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Um, oh, and don't forget about pap smears as well. Oh, please. So, so uh, all, all the things that, that we need to do. And like I said, yearly CT scans for people that are at higher risk for lung cancer because they're longtime smokers. That so was, um, she was watching a meeting the other day and, and she, she was talking about past spirits and then a bunch of guys got a blank look on their face. She, it was she, funny. She went off. She said, you don't know what that is. <laughs> so, anyway, so these are graphs breaking down the incidence rates so and new cases that are diagnosed and the death rate per 100,000 going um, both both sexes combined and then breaking it down for males and females, looking at racial ethnic groups. And so that way, um, because, you know, there's different, uh, the different groups that we have in the U.S., of which there are many because we have a pretty diverse um, country, um, we're not uh, skewing the data towards the bigger population. So this way we can compare apples to apples, same to same. So when we look at the incidence rate, we can see that um, American Indian Alaska Natives have a higher incidence rate. Um, uh, white people are next, uh, black people are next, and we see a fairly low incidence rate among Hispanics and non-Hispanics, Asian and Pacific Islanders. So um, some of that we think is because um, to, to, the, to, the, to the extent that these populations have different diets or to the extent that these populations haven't adapted to the American diet, which is called the, the standard American diet or SAD, um, that they're not eating as many processed foods, yeah, that they're not doing the unhealthy things that we do in America, their health is better. Okay, now the bad news is look at the death rates. Look at the death rates. So now we're seeing um, the number one death rate is non-Hispanic Black Americans. The number two is American Indian Alaska Natives. Number three is white people. Um, number, oh wait, no, number three was, yeah, number three is white. And then the um, uh, uh, Asian Pacific Islanders and Hispanics are still pretty low in terms of death so rates. you got to ask yourself, so white people have... A greater increase in black people, but black people fare a lot more poorly in terms of outcome. What's wrong with that picture? Right? Yeah. And so we see this different cancers. Um, we see uh, bigger gaps and smaller gaps. So, for example, I think there's a gap in prostate cancer. I think there's a gap. There's definitely a gap in cervical cancer that black women tend to get diagnosed later than white women. And so their five year survival rate is, is lower. And so we really need to work hard on making sure that every population has access to care for both screening, diagnosis, and treatment. And um, we need to make sure that these, um, these care gaps are eliminated because, you know, as a cancer patient, I feel very strongly that there's not a single person in this country that should be diagnosed with cancer and not get the care that they need. You see the breakdown of men and women here, and you guys can check that out on your own, too. Now, what, what, um, if you look at the American Cancer Society, and I'm giving you links to their cancer.org website, they talk about, you know, what could possibly be causing these things. So if you get diagnosed with cancer and you're educated and you have more income and you have good insurance, you're probably going to do better. Um, if you live close to a major academic medical center like we do, I go to UCSD for my treatment. And we have a bunch down here. That's, and, and see, that's a I've got City of Hope. I've community. got UCI. I've got I've got USC. You know, so 
we have an abundance of resources here in Southern California that I can get, you know, diagnosed and treated at. So those are all things that make my um, outcome better. And I'm, if I, I'm, I'm guessing that maybe South Central doesn't have as many hospitals, clinics, yeah. clinics as we do. So, so it just so happens in Irvine right now, City of Hope just built a big facility. You see Irvine just built a big facility. Yeah, Hogue, Hogue, um, Hogue just built a big facility. So, you know, they go to where the people have right, money. Right. Um, so people that are lower income, people that live in rural areas, people that don't speak English as well, people that um, that don't have a lot of education, they're going to have trouble navigating the healthcare system and getting the good care. So all of you people in this class, because you are now college educated people, you got to promise me to help out your relatives if they get diagnosed with serious diseases so that you can help them navigate the, the medical right. system and you can help them get access to really good care. I kind of jumped um, again, but this is an example of the medical system right here. Um, and, you know, I, we have this horrible political situation of vaccine fatigue, et cetera. But it's clear right here that um, the HPV vaccine that you all should have gotten before you went to um, USC, um, you can see what it's done to um, cancer rates right here, which is yeah. dramatic. Now, the, originally when the HPV vaccine came out, and it came out when our, our two boys were young, and you know before they were even old enough to get it, and they were giving it to kind of kind of young teenagers, and then they expanded the recommendations and said, "Hey, you can get it up to age 26, so you are all eligible to get the HPV vaccine, which I believe now is a series of three shots. Even if you just get one or two, you're going to have a better outcome than if you get nothing. What we're seeing in the data is remarkable. So Australia has has is they're a little bit ahead of the U.S. Scotland is a little bit ahead of the U.S. where they've rolled out. Um, HPV vaccine campaigns and have had really good uptake, we're seeing a dramatic decrease in cervical cancer. Now, right now in the world, every two minutes, a woman dies from cervical cancer. We have a vaccine that prevents cervical cancer. Period. That's really, really effective. And, and I had a good friend who got um, throat cancer. Yeah. So we and, have... And he's a guy. Yeah. And he should have, you know... He, he was too, put it, he was ahead of the curve. He's, you know, closer to my age. So missed yeah, the so opportunity. Yeah, so he didn't have access to but it. But you guys had the opportunity now yeah. as guys to avoid oral Yeah, cancers. so uh, both of our sons, I made sure that they were vaccinated against HPV, even even though the data wasn't there yet showing that HPV also was implicated in a lot of different types of cancers, not just um cervical cancer, but oral cancers, um, throat cancers, um, anal and rectal cancers, a lot of things that we don't want to get. So, um, so anyway, that's my speech. I, I'm, I'm, I like to preach about HPV. We have this vaccine and, um, there is research on other vaccines too. Um, vaccines that let's say you're diagnosed and treated with breast cancer. We can give you a vaccine and make sure that the breast cancer doesn't come yeah, back. It's, yeah, it's so, getting um, better and better. The whole vaccine yeah. um, intervention. All right. Awesome. All right. So this is all about cancer right here. Okay. It explains how the mechanisms and Julie's going to tell you about the two kind of drivers. All right. So there's a PDF file right here that I just kind of breeze by that you can, that you can download. Okay. If you want to um, read more about it, it's right there from cancer.gov. Um, it explains all the mechanisms and then we can scroll down here. Um, you can access the websites. Okay. And then these are some really, really simple videos that, that that lay it out. And then within that video, there are, is a context of really two major um, genetic drivers. And, you know, we looked at, Julie looks at all the things, you know, like cigarette smoking. Um, you heard that. Okay, that's a carcinogen. We heard about viruses. Well, viruses get up there and modify the DNA as well. Um, and then inflammation from obesity modifies the DNA. And when it modifies radiation from the maybe, sun, radiation from the sun modifies the DNA and it trade, tr turns a normal gene into a cancer gene. And, and these are the two categories of cancer genes that you can get right here. So this is um, um, really important and it is on the quiz and a lot of people yeah. get confused. So a proto-oncogene gets mutated and turns into an on oncogene. So the oncogene provides the gas so that that cell will continue to divide and grow and, um, and grow unchecked. And that's what makes a cancer cell different from a regular cell. Tumor suppressor genes are really helpful when they're not mutated, when they're what we call wild type. So tumor suppressor genes 
prevent tumors from developing. They suppress the tumors. But when they get mutated, then the brakes of your car are broken. So that allows the cancer to grow and divide unchecked. So um, fun fact, um, one of the famous tumor suppressor genes is called P53. The most common... Um, Genetic mutation of all cancers. Yeah. Um, elephants have many, 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 many copies of P53. Elephants don't get cancer. So it's that's kind of a cool thing that people can study elephants to figure it out. People only have two copies, um, one on each chromosome of P53. So if one of them gets inactivated, you're going to have problems. If both of them get inactivated by being mutated, you're gonna have a lot of problems. You're gonna have a much higher risk chance of, of developing cancer. So this is a, it's an unfortunate way of naming it to so these uh, proto-oncogenes, okay? If they're just growth genes, okay? And so that was a major discovery. And when, when um, uh, researchers and clinicians were trying to figure out, you know, what, what causes cancer? Well, it's just a mutation in a normal growth gene that makes it cause growth, but on rocket fuel. So let's say you produce, um, uh, a new skin cell every 20 days, okay? And suddenly you start producing a new skin cell every two seconds, okay? And it's because that growth gene has changed and it's driving the system much harder, like Julie said, like yeah. the gas pedal. And yeah. then the the um, the um, tumor suppressor gene, what it does is it's sitting there surveying and is what it says, wait a minute, stop cell division. We're gonna go in there and we're gonna repair the DNA so that the cell will go back to dividing normally, you know, going back from every two seconds to back every 20 days. But if the mutations are so bad, it basically is a kill switch and it'll, it'll kill the cell off so that it's gone. So you lose that yeah. and the cells survive and, uh, and then they, they get worse and worse and worse and more and more mutations. So everybody has cells um, circulating in their bodies that have right weird mutations. And, and your body has these healthy mechanisms that go in and clean them. it up. And your, your body goes around, you have little garbage trucks that go around and say, hey, you're not right. I'm going to gobble you up and make right. sure you die. Yeah. Um, and that normal process is called apoptosis, which right. is normal cell death. And then normal ca and, and typical cancer cells don't undergo that normal cell death. And so that's why your cancer cells, they'll continue to mutate. Um, yeah, you got to get rid of the bad guys or they'll just, they just go off. You know, yeah. Something. And sometimes like with my type of cancer, you can kill most of them, but it's hard to kill all of them. They they'll hide. Ha they'll hide in the lymph nodes. They'll hide in the bone marrow for me. And so I could have remission for a couple of years. Yeah, you know what? She's tougher than cancer. I am tougher than cancer. You know, you know, my little t-shirt. All right. You know what I am? I'm Bill Belichick. <laughs> For the football fans. We like to dress in costume for our videos. <laughs> <laughs> and we're pumped for the Super Bowl because, well, this is a weird thing to say, but I'm a Saints fan and my team isn't in it, so it's no stress for me. I can cheer for both teams. Uh, they're both good, they're yeah. both good teams to cheer for, for sure. So anyway, okay. Well, let's talk about our discussion, which is about grief and loss. Um, I always tell students, because we know that a lot of students lost loved ones during the COVID pandemic, and you may have had a, a death of someone close to you, and you may not feel comfortable talking about this in um, the discussion board. If that's the case, email me. I can give you an alternative assignment. Um, I want you to be comfortable. But, or you may be, you may say, well, I have never experienced loss. So we're not just talking about death. We're talking about loss. It can be you didn't get the internship you wanted. You didn't get the grade you wanted in that class. You, you lost a pet. Um, you know, you got fired from your job, your girlfriend or boyfriend or, or whatever broke up with you. Um, you had a fight with a friend. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can feel grief and loss, not just with death. You get home and, and you, you know, had, you've got burritos and tacos and, and you ordered guacamole and you open up in your back and there's no guacamole. And that's a feeling of loss. <laughs> <laughs> so John had shoulder surgery I last did. last summer, July 10th. And he I circled the drain. He <laughs> has not been able to do his normal activities like surfing ever since. And he's just recently just gotten started. clear. And let me tell you, John was experiencing a lot of grief I and was. loss. Um, so, so if you have an injury or an illness or anything like that, you're dealing with loss. So the seven, the five, the five stages of coping, um, based on Elizabeth Kubler Ross is denial, anger, bargaining, despair, and acceptance. But I went surfing. So oh. <laughs> I can't see it, but that was just me surfing on a wave. Actually me going down. The That's beach. awesome, John. Yeah. <laughs> okay. so 
okay, go ahead. Denial, anger, bargaining, despair, acceptance. This is one theory about grief. It's not the only theory about grief. So if it doesn't resonate with you and if you don't think, well, that's exactly what I did. Right here. But yeah. I think what's important is to recognize no two people grieve the same exact way. If you lose someone in your family, your family members may not all grieve the same way. And different cultures have different approaches to grieving and loss. So, you know, if you experience a loss, be kind to yourself. Be, um, you know, give yourself time. Um, allow yourself to feel the feelings. It's okay to be sad, whether it's for a week or a month or, or five years. My mom passed away in 2018 and she and I were super, super close and we talked all the time and just, you know, she just made me laugh and she was so awesome and so wonderful. And to this day, if I walk into a store that I had been to with her, like Home Depot or Michael's or Hobby Lobby or whatever, I'll get tears in my eyes because I'll see something that reminds me of her. But they're they're not sad, awful, terrible tears. It's now more of a happy memory, you know, sweet tears. But yeah, the first year or so, I was really devastated because she died suddenly. Um, so, you know, give yourself time to grieve, especially if you lose someone that you really cared about. The, the amount of grief you feel may be proportional to the amount of love that you felt for that person. And um, your relationship doesn't end just because they're gone. You still have a relationship with that person, but, um, but they're just not physically present anymore. So here's your discussion. You, you um, share what you're comfortable sharing, obviously. Um, if you are uh, not comfortable, um, contact Julia and you can have an alternative assignment. Yeah. Right? And I think, um, I think it's really interesting when people share how their culture or their families approach loss and grief and, um, everyone's different. My family, um, my mom was from, my mom and dad both grew up on farms in the Midwest. And when someone dies there, the whole community comes together. It's a very rural area and, and, and everyone comes together. And it's like the funerals are like three days long because you have visitation at the funeral home. And then you have the, the service at the church. And then you have a little, little thing at the grave site. And uh, the minister of the church will be at the person's house sometimes for a day or two. Um, and they'll, and then there's a huge meal afterwards where, you know, the church ladies make the food and, you know, and so it's a really, um, when I was a kid, I used to hate it because I didn't like the open casket funerals, but, but, um, but anyway, it's now yeah. I look at it and I see how beautiful it is that people come together and support each other. And so in, in grief, there is some beauty and some, some richness of these relationships that, that we have. Can I have an open casket where I'm flipping? This no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Nope. Come on. <laughs> nope. No. All right. Hey, I'm going to also, at the same time, I'm going to send you a little uh, surprise video too. Um, so Julia is such an aficionado of cancer and she's really well, well read and well written. She sent a letter to President Obama. Oh, yeah. And there's a video um, at the four minute mark uh, where President Obama. Um, he's a unique president. He actually reads, okay? And he uh, he read her letter and contacted her, and he talked. Uh, he read, um, and then he went and had a, uh, his news conference about the Affordable Care Act, and he read her letter verbatim. It didn't change a word. It's I always tell awesome. people, if you have any doubts about democracy and the greatness of our country, recognize that there's, what, 340 million people in, in the U.S., and I wrote an email to the White House. The president read the email I mean, that's crazy that that happened. But anyway, kind of a fun story. Yeah, I know. I'll send it to you. It's around the four-minute mark, so you can watch this video and you can watch the other one. Just watch the part where he says my name. Yeah. <laughs> no, you can watch the whole thing. God, it's getting so windy okay. outside, guys. It's scary. Well, stay warm. Bonk her down. Stay warm and dry, guys, and right. safe. Peace. We'll see you next time. Fight, fight on. Fight on.